Tell me who you are. Okay, my name is Bob Coolball in New Market, Virginia. Now, what are you fixing to do here? What are, what are you going to bring out, pull out of this hangar for us to look at? The airplane you're going to see next is a replica of a 1911 Curtis Pusher. More specifically, it is built to replicate the 1911 Curtis Pusher that Eugene Ely made the first arrested shipboard landing in aboard the USS Pennsylvania on January 18, 1911. 100 years later, we have built a copy of his airplane. It's built for a lot of reasons, the main one being to be a part of the centennial of naval aviation celebrations that are taking place all over the country next year, 2011. And you were a naval aviator yourself? Yes, I was a carrier pilot. Once one, always one. I'm now an old one, but... <laughs> okay, every landing's a trap. Everyone's a trap. And. Uh, and you wouldn't want to. Shot. <laughs> you wouldn't want to try this on the Pennsylvania. I would. No, yeah. I, you know, I would much prefer not the Pennsylvania. I would much prefer one of the modern flat tops. Well, you better tell the admiral that. Any admirals out there that know that ever hear this, we lo we're looking for a ready deck. I'll take a I'll take a, a fly off of any carrier on any day, but I would love to bring this aboard a modern warship aircraft carrier. You reckon doing next year's Fleet Week in New York or San Francisco would be a good time? I sure would. <laughs> Thanks, Bob. Sure, yeah. On Ely's airplane, that's exactly what they were. Center section and the rudder were silver painted, which was a Curtis practice, but the all the wing panels and the empennage and the canard were a, linen, a varnished linen color, kind of a clear, creamy color. Snug, but not too tight on all of these wires. There's 130 of them. Different brace, drag landing, anti-drag, flying wires, and cross brace wires. Were they built to length or do they have turnbuckles? No, they do have turnbuckles and, and we have gone so far as to replicate the exact turnbuckle that uh, Glenn Curtis used on all of his Curtis pushers. It consists of a metal strap a motorcycle spoke, and then a, a motorcycle, motorcycle spoke nipple, I'll put it that way, and then a motorcycle spoke that has been shortened and then turned into a ferrule like this. This is exactly the way they looked when Glenn Curtis made these over a hundred years ago. We've now, used the same ones. Now if the Wright brothers were Army, Glenn Curtis was Navy. Yes, sir. You can follow the cables. This is a Curtis fair lead. And what they did was they flared a short piece of copper tubing, soldered a copper flange around it, and then screwed it into the struts. And all this does is position and, and retain the cable as it goes on out to the pulley. This is a fairly frail structure, so one of the things we always look for is wrinkled fabric, the top and bottom. Wrinkled fabric means you've cracked a rib, probably more than likely cracked a rib, you might have cracked a spar. This one you definitely do not make hard landings. It has no suspension other than the air that's in the three tires. So you fly it on very gently in a power on landing in order to avoid breaking something by dropping it on the pavement. The USN is a very close approximation of the only insignia that was on the very first Curtis that the Navy purchased. It was called the A-1 Triad. This was an, an earlier rendition, a land-based rendition, modified by Glenn Curtis into the A-1. They did paint the USN on the rudder of the Triad. Well, since this airplane was built for Eugene Ely and the Centennial of Naval Aviation, we had to go ahead and put USN on the rudder anyway. And that helps us to identify, helps everybody who sees the airplane to know exactly what it stands for and why we built it. He went to this swallowtail when he decided to go with a single front canard and two elevators that are independently controlled. There's two separate sets of cables that go from the control stick. One controls the left elevator, one controls the right elevator. 
And Curtis always said he did that so that if the cables broke on one or the other, or if the bamboo pole for the front canard broke, you would still have pitch authority in one of those three pitch controls. So he was thinking safety of flight at that point even. Originally I was trying to get N44VY or N8VY as the registration number uh, commemorate the Navy, but uh, N44 Victor Yankee is the closest I could get. Well, this is this is the house right here. This it's roughly it's well, I call it the little 12-inch plank that you sit on while you're flying several thousand feet up in the air. This is the only sense of security you actually have sitting in this seat is the seat belt and the shoulder harness. And you are like an eagle, open and in the wind, pretty much from the minute you lift off. As far as flight, in flight, for a horizon reference, you have the trailing edge of the canard. Looking through it to your to the clouds or the ground, you've got a reference for bank angle and pitch attitude. And that's how we use, that's what we use in order to get a feeling for climbs and glides and banks. The office, as we've got it, this control wheel controls the forward canard the, and the aft, the two elevators back there. And, you know, it's the same setup as if it were in a modern airplane stick back, houses get smaller, push the stick forward, houses get bigger. The changes that we made in order to make this airplane more safer and more flyable in modern times is we did put rudder pedals and we do control the rudder via the rudder pedals as opposed to the way Curtis originally did and that was he wrapped the rudder cable around the yoke and by turning the yoke you turned the rudder pedals. The ailerons are now, on this airplane, hooked up directly by cable to the control wheel, just like a modern airliner or a modern airplane, which meant we had to have rudder pedals to control the rudder, so there was a change there. And also, putting rudder pedals in for us gave us the opportunity to put brake cylinders, so we're running Cessna 152 brake cylinders and brakes on the airplane. And we had to do that in order to be able to operate on pavement and around crowds, you know, in, in a modern environment. With the changes that you've made to this aeroplane to make it safe and flyable, what would the difference be, be center of gravity-wise, lift-wise, et cetera, weight and balance-wise, between this and what Eugene Healy had to land on under Pennsylvania? Not much. No. It's a little bit lighter, maybe. The engine's a little bit lighter. The airframe could be a little bit heavier. So, I mean, it's probably a little bit lighter, but maybe less than 100 pounds lighter, maybe 50 pounds lighter, maybe. You're talking about this machine this, this being lighter than his. Possibly a little bit, but other than that, not much difference aerodynamically. And it's we, more reliable. Yeah. That's, the, that's about the, we, as we like to say, we only have a 60-year-old engine instead of a 100-year-old engine. So a 100-year-old airplane to 60-year-old engine. I Bob, would you air, like to would you like to add to that or take away from it? Well, no, I agree with him. The airfoil is identical and it has the same incidents as Ely's did. So, theoretically, with the same thrust, the same amount of horsepower, we should have similar performance to his, and we do. The other thing is, as far as center of gravity is concerned, we might be a little bit further aft than his. Oh, I don't think so. You don't think so no, with our engine so. being further? No, no, well, you guys are the only no, existing. No, I, don't think, yeah. I, th okay. I think the CG, we, if anything, we're for it because we got the battery up front. Well, we do have battery up front. Yeah, no, yeah. I, I think so. I think we it's may very be right similar. on it then. Yeah, we may be. Yeah. But it's the CG is aft. There's no. From a normal From airplane. a normal modern airplane. Well, let's look her on or uh, not whole pilots. We'll have to accept that because you're the only two extant 1911, 1910. Uh, yeah. Uh, naval aviators around. <laughs> hey, I went to 4,200 feet the other day. 4,200. In this airport. Bob, what is, your, what is your favorite accomplishment so far? <laughs> Not going to 4,200 feet. <laughs> My favorite accomplishment is that I have as many landings as I have takeoffs. <laughs> and you haven't bent it. I haven't fixed anything. 
Well, we haven't really bent it. I mean, <laughs> yeah, we've, we've replaced things that weren't right, but yeah, it's, it's in one solid great piece. Curtis built a good airplane, and we were able to, you know, we capitalized on that. Okay. Thank you, gentlemen.